Good morning and welcome to the public lectures at Toronto Spirit Society. My name is Jose Moussi and it's a great pleasure and joy to have us uh, this morning for a very interesting conversation uh, lecture by our colleague Marco Magalhães who will be talking about the law of destruction. The Toronto Spirit Society is based here in Toronto and we're slowly beginning our opening process after the pandemic restrictions. Uh, you'll hear more about this after the lecture. So please stay tuned, watch the full lecture, and then you'll get some uh, very good news about uh, opening up at the Toronto Spirit Society. As we start, I'd like to begin with a very short passage uh, by the Spirit Emmanuel in the kind of introduction of the Missionaries of the Light. This is a, a very important book where Chic Xavier, through the Spirit André Luis, brings us some very important insights of the relationship between the spiritual world and the physical world. And in this, they're describing a new era, a new generation, a new interaction between these two worlds. And Emmanuel wanted to make sure that we understand the implications of what is being asked of us. So he says, on facing this new era and considering the great endeavor of renewal, the cooperation of all faithful servants of truth and the good is requested so that more than anything else, they may live the new faith, each and every one improving and uplifting themselves on the way to a better world so that the teachings of Christ may prevail over the mere words of fine-sounding ideologies. In the execution of this lofty task, incarnates and discarnates of goodwill are coming together <clears throat> building the bridge of light over which humankind <clears throat> will cross the abyss of ignorance and death. I really like this passage. It speaks very well what we hear at the Toronto Spirit Society. So this being said, um, please join me on a very short prayer where we lift our thoughts to God our Creator, to Jesus our Master and Teacher, and ask their protection, their mercifulness to us for we are imperfect beings who will come together to learn and to try to become a little bit better every day. We also are very thankful for all of the volunteers, all of the workers that make this a reality, whether they're here physically, uh, working virtually, or even working further apart in the spiritual world. We all come together with the purpose of helping each other, helping each other be better, more <clears throat> informed, and above all, uh, true followers of the God's wishes and the words of Christ. So be it. So be it. With that, I invite Marco to come and give us uh, what I'm certain will be a very interesting lecture. Thank you. So thank you all. Uh, it's such a, a wonderful moment for us to be uh, here in our house, uh, the Toronto Spirit Society. Uh, with all of you, um, the ones that are physically or spiritually here, the ones that are connected with us. So welcome, uh, and let us, uh, let us have this conversation about the law of destruction, which is, which is in a way, uh, one of those uh, very interesting, sometimes like, ignorant, you know, like, a, like an enigma or something that's confusing to people, right? When they, thought, they, they think about the laws of God and, and one of the laws being laws of destruction, and, and that you know, for many people would not make a lot of sense. Um, but we also understand that the law should be taken together as a body of knowledge and understanding of what, what God is. And obviously, the you know, you have to tie it together with the law of love, justice, right? Everything else that we learn from our Creator. So what exactly is the law of destruction? Spiritism is going to help us a lot uh, understand this, this concept, uh, which is... Uh, it's, it's, it's basically a, a concept that things that to, for, every, for everything that we see and we live or we observe, we touch, we feel, we experience, everything's going to be renewed, remodeled, and will evolve. That's pretty much what the law of destruction means. But for things to be renewed and, uh, and, and, and for things to improve, uh, many changes have to occur, right? And these changes is basically what the law of destruction are talking about. This is not new, and this is certainly, uh, science has actually 
uh, taught us a little bit about it. Um, so uh, if you might remember this, but it's, uh, Antoine Lavoisier, um, in the, he was born in the 1700s in Paris, in France, and he taught us something very interesting. Uh, obviously, he's well known for so many things, right? So he was the one that named and discovered oxygen, hydrogen, combustion, um, very, very well known chemist. Uh, but he also did one interesting experiment um, that we still teach today because it's so relevant to all of us is that he was able to, uh, you know, put fire on a piece of wood, for example. And many people uh, in the past believed that when the wood was catching fire, um, and then in the, in the end, all you have are the ashes in the end, there was a difference, right, between what you input into that reaction, the wood itself, the weight, right, the mass of that, versus what was left behind, which was basically a little bit of, uh, a little bit of ashes, which was not the same weight, like it was different. Um, but uh, Lavoisier was able to capture all the gases that um, were uh, arising from that fire, and then he realized that they were exactly the same. So there were no changes. So he came up with the idea that nothing really is lost, um, nothing is created, everything is transformed. Okay? Uh, and that is really the, the basic, fun, the fundamental concept of the law of destruction is that for all of us, spiritually speaking or physically speaking, really nothing is lost, nothing is created for, uh, from us but everything is transformed. In other words, we will continue to transform ourselves like our planet does the same thing. Planet Earth is evolving, right? It's transforming too. We are transforming. The animals are, the plants are, every single thing in the universe continues to be transformed. And for that transformation to occur, uh, um, some events have to take place, and that's what the law of destruction talks about. Right? So, question number 728. Alan Kardec is going to ask the spirits very specifically on the spirits book. So, is destruction a law of nature? Right? That is an interesting question because what he's referring to, if you go back to the 1750s to 1850s, which kind of the, the hundred years before between Lavoisier and Kardec, so this is right before spiritism was embodied by the work of Kardec, there are all these transformations occurring in the planet, right? You have the uh, transformations of industry, right? You have transformations in the city. You have a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, um, um, convolution. Uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of um, uh, society changes in society and changes into the planet and changes everywhere. And that is the background why uh, Kardec starts with this question. And the spirits are going to answer is that. It is necessary for everything to be destroyed in order to be reborn and regenerated. Right? What you call destruction, what we are calling destruction, right, is no more than transformation. Right? So it's not really destruction because nothing really is lost. Right? It's just like we are really evolving. Right? And there are things that occur during that process that can be traumatized into our eyes. Right? So transformation is aimed at renewing and improving living beings, right? Do you want an example? So as science has proven to us today that the same carbon atoms that are part of our bodies today, that form our skin and our organs, were mu very much uh, likely the same carbon item, uh, atoms that were part of dinosaurs when they lived on Earth. So that is one interesting concept because really we are physically the same, constituted by the same type of material. But you know, our bodies throughout the years have been uh, decomposed by our planet and will be recreated by that same element in a much different way. So we are being transformed. But in order for that transformation to occur, everything has to be in a way, destroyed, as we say in, in the laws, uh, as Kardec asked, but realistically, it's just transformed. So, let's think about this. So, how, when you woke up this morning and you go into your car, unless you have an electric car, which this would not apply, but if you go into your car and you turn it on, basically you're burning fossil fuels. Um, and if you think carefully about this, too, that same energy that allows us to move right now is actually created by the combustion 
of bodies of uh, beings or plants or animals that survived millions of years ago and turned into petroleum. So think about this. So we are again transforming, right? That uh, the same type of material into very different uh, uses, right? So the spirits are very clear about this. There's really no destruction. There is transformation, right? But, you know, Kardec keeps uh, inquiring the, the spirits in that same line because this is obviously can be difficult, right, to understand at the first time. So he asks, you know, has destruction, um, the, you know, instinct, right, been given to living beings for providential purposes, right? Is this something that we are allowed to do? Like, how does that work? In other words, can we go down and destroy everything? No, that's not, that's not the case, right? So the spirits are going to answer that God's creatures, us, right, are the instruments that God uses for attaining divine ends. Oh, wait a minute. So the spirits are telling us that we are co-creators with God, aren't we, right? So we are constantly um, uh, changing or transforming things around us, right? Because we are creating together. We are in this same process of transformation, right? But that brings something very important, too, because we are also responsible, right? So, if we are co-creators, we are responsible and we have to be careful in how we do that process. So, the spirits are going to continue. I'm going to read directly from the spirit book here. In order to feed themselves, right, us, living beings destroy each other, right, with the dual purpose of maintaining the balance of reproduction, which might otherwise become excessive, and utilizing the remains of their external envelopes. So, so in our current planet, yeah. So animals and plants and and all living beings, they go. We actually have to survive by eating each other. That's how the system is designed. And in a way, we control populations of animals, right? And at the same time, we uh, we take we get the energy from it, but we can't abuse it, right? So things have to be very careful. Uh, but it's only the envelope that is destroyed, and that is the most important thing. Because the spirits are reminding us, when we talk about destruction, we're talking about destruction of matter, like physical elements, not who we are. So the envelope is only an accessory, and not essential part of the being. Right? The essential part is indestructible, which is us as spirits. Right? So why is this so important? Because it really takes the concept of the law of destruction, meaning that, uh, you know, things have to be destroyed anyway. So, yeah, let's, let's put everything on fire and get out of here because, you know, that's the law. That's not how it works, right? It also gives us more responsibility, understanding that we as the spirits are responsible, right? And we are indestructible. And we have to be very conscious and careful about what we do, right, as co-creators of the universe. But then there's another concept that is, that is also very challenging sometimes to understand. So we now understand that destruction really is not destruction, it's transformation. We now understand that we talk about destruction is really not we as spirits are the physical elements of the planet that we live. Right? And now there's a third part here is that a lot of, like it's happening all the time, and I'm going to go through some examples here. Um, when there are uh, destructive calamities, like uh, a volcano eruption, for example, we have recently, right, in the Canary Islands, or the tsunami that occurred um, uh, 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 a few years ago, or fires, or, you know, all these um, uh, convulsive elements that are occurring in the planet that are causing calamities. So is that part of the law of destruction, right? The, so, so Kardec asks the spirits, for what purpose does God inflict humankind with destructive calamity? Then the spirits are going to answer, to impel them to progress more quickly. Haven't we stated that destruction is necessary for the moral regeneration of spirits who accomplish a new degree of perfection during each new existence? You must see the end in order to appreciate the results. You only judge certain things from your own personal point of view, and you regard such afflictions as calamities because of the injury they cause you. However, 
these hardships are often necessary in order to make things arrive at a better order more quickly and to accomplish in a few years what would otherwise require many, many centuries. Wow, now we're really coming from a very basic concept of destruction as um, you know, physical elements, right? To a completely new um, idea, which is basically, yeah, calamities and mass destruction and things have to occur, not only because of what you see there as destruction, but most importantly, because that's a way for us to evolve more quickly. But how is that possible, right? To think about this, like from our own perspective, right? Look at our own uh, point of view, as the Spirit is saying here, we see pain everywhere, right? We see people discriminating, we see suffering, right? Uh, and that, that does not seem to be perfectly united with God being perfect, right? And that may be a point where a lot of people question their faith. And they may even say, well, why is this happening to me, right? Am I being punished, right? Which is, you know, another, another way of seeing this. But the spirits are very clear. I right? just say, no, everything happens for a reason, right? And because God's perfect, for sure, there is a good reason for that to happen, right? And we're all going to get better. But, you know, that's not easy, right? So let's think about what's happening right today, right, with COVID-19. Um, if you think about what, what we've been through in the last almost two years, more than a year and a half now, um, so there has been a lot of changes in our planet, right? So we started with a, a pandemic, right, that uh, claimed the lives of millions of people throughout the world uh, in a very short period of time. And you can see that as plain suffering uh, for all, um, which is one way of seeing it. But you can also see, as the spirits are telling here, a way that we can evolve and improve in a, in a scenario that is challenging. So do you, if you want examples of that, here are some. So imagine that through this pandemic, we were forced to think about others and make actions to ourselves they are not necessarily designed to protect ourselves, but to protect others, right? It's a basic concept, right? But it's such an important one. So how many people, for example, had to, you know, take certain precautions or vaccinate uh, in order to protect others, right? So you were forced to put yourself in a situation that you have to think about others first. That's hard for some people, right? That is a way of you making decisions that necessarily will, will help others primarily sometimes, right? Help you too, but help others primarily. So in a way, the, we are all evolving because this is really what God wants from us, right? To take opportunities like this and allow us to consciously, through our own efforts, improve, right? So how many of us that saw people uh, going through, you know, the, this health crisis caused by COVID-19 and started helping others, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing that. And all of a sudden, here we are, collectively, the whole planet working together to help other people, right? Oh, but do we have to go through this, Mark? No, we don't have to go through this, right? But there are some moments that you know, with the help of the spirituality, certain things happen to accelerate this process, right? Could we all have evolved the same way without any calamity? Yes, we could, right? But certainly we didn't do a good job, right? We didn't do it, right? So in the, so with the pandemic arising and, uh, and this entire, you know, this entire changes that we're seeing in society, we are forced to put ourselves to make decisions. And some of us cannot make that decision yet, right? Some of us will still struggle and the egoistic view of the universe that still, you know, in, in some of us will take hold and do not allow us to think about others. And for all of us making that decision, there will be consequences, right? Maybe not consequences now, um, 
today, but eventually when we, we take full conscious in, in, the, uh, in the spirit world of what we've done, um, we're going to feel consequences of all those decisions. Because really what's happening is, is a turning point, I think, in the way our society sees each other. Right? Um, so we know that pandemic is now in most places going under control, not completely under control. But still, many of those sentiments and the feelings are being exposed all throughout the world. Like most of us agree that we have to protect ourselves and protect others. That's obvious, right? But still, other people don't. And, and that, that clash of ideas, right, uh, will continue for some time. Like it happens in, in our planet for so many times, so many years. Right? So it is our duty as brothers and sisters to love one another, help each other in any way we can. Even if I help each other, I'll have to make decisions that primarily only affect others, right? So that's very important. So, the Kardec asks that, so, see, Kardec is so, Kardec is, is so uh, to the point um, that he's going to ask exactly that question. So that's, um, uh, uh, he's going to ask uh, the, uh, the spirits. The, but the moral person, like imagine someone perfect, if someone had like, you know, it's like that's like a, like a beautiful soul that lives on this planet, and that moral person succumbs to the calamities too, right? And then we, with our narrow eyes, are going to look at that to say, "Ha, that's wrong, right? See, only the good people die, right? Yeah, God is, I don't know what God is doing, right? He's just punishing people that shouldn't be doing anything." Because that's our own narrow view of the world, right? So he's going to say, so the moral person succumbs to this kind of along the wicked. So everybody dies, right? Let's say, in the, in the scenario. Is this just, right? So again, taking what we're going through in, in right now in, in our world, yes, there are some people that are vaccinated, are isolating, they're masked, and they still succumb to COVID-19, right? It happens, right? Uh, it not that happen all the time. But it does happen, right? We have persons that are taking all precautions, are still going through a disease process. And we have the other individuals that have done nothing and go through the same disease process and they have the same outcome, right? How is this fair, right? That's exactly what Kardec is answer, asking the spirits. So the spirits are going to say, throughout life, humans relate everything to their body. But after death, they think differently. As we have already stated, the life of the body is almost nothing. A sanctuary in your world, in this world, is but a flesh in eternity. The suffering that lasts a few months or days are nothing and are only a lesson that will serve you in the future. Right? It's a lesson for all of us. Spirits who have pre-existed and have survived everything else comprise the real world. They are the children of God and the objects of the divine kindness. Bodies are no more than disguises behind which they make their appearance in the world. In the great calamities that decimate humankind, moral persons who succumb are like an army which, during war, sees that its uniforms have become tattered worn out or lost. The general is more concerned for his soldiers than the uniforms. Mm. Ah, look at that. Mm -hmm. So, in, uh, in, uh, in a direct comparison to war, which is obviously one of the major calamities that happen you know, throughout our existence many times, many, many, many times, the Spirit has given us another very important point to think about, is that you know, when we see someone going through the apparent suffering of the disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that that spirit is being punished or suffering unnecessarily or anything like that. It really is one step of that moral evolution, which is a tiny one. And usually the spirit that is a very good spirit, evolved spirit that incarnates for that mission, for them, it's a blessing. It's like a mission. They're, they're going through what they've agreed to in order to help others around them, right? So don't look at their torn uniforms, right, with their bodies, right? So look at them as that spirit that is now so evolved that that very brief time of physical 
ailment, suffering ailment, doesn't mean much. It means just another step on their evolution. In the contrary, the ones that insisted in contributed directly to the development of that condition that was avoidable, that's going to be a real suffering down the road because that's going to affect the spirit itself, not the body only, right? So we have to separate those two things. From our eyes, from our perspective, we look at those two, the, the good moral person that's coming and then the, the one that is still learning, right? The wicked, as they ask the spirits here. And we're seeing that they're going through exactly the same process. It's not. It's completely different, right? God is perfectly unjust. He would never allow someone to discriminate without being planned or being correct or being just. Okay? So we got to take that, that concept out of our minds. So, and then Kardec, follow-up question after that. So couldn't calamities also be moral trials for humankind by exposing humans to the most afflicted needs? Yes, right? Think about this. So think about what we're going through again, like we're saying, like so many people now doing whatever they can to support each other, right, during the pandemic. Like the, the, the healthcare workers, the people that had to, to still, the, um, uh, still continue their jobs and to work, the ones who volunteer to go and help people, right? Um, uh, it's just like all those things, there's those positive energies that were all of us, the whole universe was sending towards those, right? That is that's transformational. So the spirits are going to say, the calamities are trials that furnish humans with an opportunity to exert their intelligence and to demonstrate their patience and resignation before the will of God, right? And we tend to think that pandemic is something totally new that never happened before. It's like, you know, this is the first time in humanity. And that's not true. There are many pandemics that happened before. And just to make our lives a little bit more complicated, not only they happened before, but we, we didn't have as nearly as the same capacity we have to deal with them. So if you go back to the Spanish flu pandemic, for example, where, you know, we have absolutely, we have no vaccines, we have no treatments, and still, you know, people went through their lives using, you know, all sorts of designs of masks that they, they've created on their own, right, in their own house, because we didn't have a, a company that produced masks for everyone. We didn't have any 95s. We didn't have, you know, uh, anything. So, so the only concept that we had at the time is that, yeah, we have to isolate from each other, because realistically, that's the only thing we could do. Um, and now we're going through another process of the pandemic, very similar to the Spanish flu in a way, um, very lethal, uh, as we can all see. And now we have all this information, support, vaccines, protocols, everything in place, scientific support for things. And we're still in the same mode of, you know, complaining about things all the time, right? Or questioning or, or disregarding evidence, right? Which is like a new new trend, right, and uh, it's happening around. So the spirits answer that, right? So, so see, this is atemporal, right? You can actually read this at any time in history and you still have the same information. So, so at the same time, they're going to say, calamities enable us, right, to develop symptoms of self-denial, self-detachment, and love for their neighbor, right? And, and, and we, we have very close experiences with that. And I know... Uh, at some point during the pandemic, I was getting, like, almost every day, a, a message saying, you know, this person or that person that I knew were um, in hospital, right, with COVID. And, and at a time that we didn't know was going to happen, right? So at that time, basically, like, a COVID ICU admission was pretty lethal, right? So we're like a 50-50 shot of surviving that. So that developed... Like this constant feeling in us, it's like wow. Let's project all these good thoughts for that person, or for that person. Someone we've never thought before. We never said anything good about that person for fifty years, right? When was the last time you prayed for someone on your WhatsApp group? Like tell me, right? So you did it during the pandemic, right? So your WhatsApp group turned into a prayer group, right? Almost. 
And it did not happen before. I can guarantee you that in the very few occasions, right? So how many times you would, uh, you, know, you know, you would get information about someone that you saw, I don't know. I mean, I remember some of the, the group messages that I received was like, you know, someone I saw 30 years ago. And I had, a, I had a hard time even remembering who that person was. But it did not matter. I was actually praying for them, right? So the pandemic allowed us to do that. Because the spirits are telling us, it allows us to enable our self-detachment and love to one another without strings, right? Um, and that's really the core of this, right? So why are we going through this? I ask that, I'm being asked that question all the time. Uh, and it is a trial, right? It is a trial, but it's a global trial. It's not a trial of Marco, Sandra, and Joe only, right? It's not us going through our little challenge here in the Toronto Spirit Society. It is a global challenge. So every single person on this planet, incarnate and discarnate, are actually going through the same ability to make a decision right now, right? And, and this decision is essential for the next step in our planet, which is the world of regeneration. Because this is actually what it will continue to allow us to say, hey, yes, you passed the threshold, you're going to continue to regenerate. Or say, sorry, buddy, that was a good try, but I think you're better suited in another planet, right? That is still in the same type of vibration that you have right now, of, of hatred, right, of anger, like, you know, like those, those negative feelings that we sometimes do. Because some people receive that same message that I did, saying that this, this, this guy next to you, and they said, this is not true, this is like, this is made up, this is not real, you know, they're not taking this and this and that medication, that's why they did that can't believe this is happening, this is a lie, I hate it, right? So instead of connecting to the self-denial mode and, and to the love one another mode, you connect to the old, old passions that are still take place in your soul, and you reconnect to this energy that is very dense, very negative, and very, very, um, very disturbing. And then you make that decision, right? So it is a trial, and trials... We make the decisions, but that's okay. Like some people can't make that decision. And we should also not be angry at the ones that are angry because that makes us angry too, right? So we, we're not different then. Like if everyone is angry at each other and it doesn't matter how much you're praying on your WhatsApp group, right? You're still angry, right? It's like we talked last week about, you know, you know when, you're, when you're talking about... Um, you know, uh, vegetarians and non-vegetarians, and like, you know, if you're if you're more concerned, if you're angry about what the other guy is eating, then it doesn't matter what you're eating. You're you're not in good shape, right? Because that's not good. So the same idea here. If you're angry about someone who exposed different views to you, even if they're most absurd and nonsensical, then you're we're lowering yourself to the same type of vibration that they have, which makes no sense, right? So we should also be, and that's the trick, right? It's not only, okay, okay, yeah, I feel for everyone that's suffering right now, but you should also feel for everyone that is against and angry and disrupting things. You should also feel for them too, because they will suffer more than the ones that are suffering right now, for sure, right? Down the road, the ones that are certainly, you know, blocking the entrance of ambulance and hospitals because they are against masks, they are going to suffer more than the ones that are actually inside the ambulance, right? It's not going to be now, but we know because spirits, see, the spirits already answered us. In 1850, they exactly told us exactly what we need to do, like now and probably in 200 years, we can read the same passage and say, wow, yeah, they knew it. How did they do that, right? Um, so that is something that we have to think about. But there are other laws too that are important. So the law of society. See, so is it is absolute isolation contrary to the law of nature, right? So you talk about the isolation and, you know, like, you know, isolating yourselves, right? So the spirits answer yes, because people instinctively seek so social living and because all of them must cooperate in humankind's progress by mutually helping one another, right? So that's interesting. 
because we're not doing full isolation. We are physically distancing, which is very difficult for, my, for isolation. Isolation means I don't even think or refer or talk or approximate or deliver thoughts to anyone. That's real full isolation. So I go down to the top of the mountain and all I think about is whatever I think, but not to other people. We're not doing that. So stop saying that we're really isolating. We're not isolating. We have all million sources of communication to talk to people, right? Now imagine if you're in the Spanish flu era with your, with your paper mask that looks like a, like a toucan big, right? And you had no computer and no phone or nothing. And you really are like that, then that is very more challenging, right? Now we have all sorts of communications. We have all support and we're in the same mode, right? Complaining. So the law of freedom, right? Are there positions in the world in which persons can flatter themselves by believing they enjoy absolute freedom? This is for the ones that think they're free. That's their freedom to not wear a mask, right? That's their freedom. That's what I'm saying. So look at the spirits are going to say, no. Because all of you, at least as well as the greatest, need one another, right? So I, So my freedom really... Is not full. It doesn't exist full freedom in this world, right? When we understand the, the laws of God and all the laws of God are inside of us, then we're fully free. Because freedom means following the laws of God. That's what freedom is, right? So if I'm excusing my behavior because I'm claiming to have freedom, we're just forgetting that freedom in this planet means needing one another. So if the other person is dead because of my freedom, that's not freedom anymore because the other guy is dead, right? And we have to pay consequences for that. So that makes no sense, right? And again, the spirits are going to tell us that, right? Okay. Um, okay. So let's think about, uh, is, is this, I have a few more minutes here. So I'm going to mention to you another example where I think represents this really, really well, the law of destruction, right? In the book, Planetary Transition by Devaldo. Um, and Filomena uh, Dominada, they describe um, the aftermath of the uh, tsunami, right, that occurred in 2000, right? So they look at it from a spiritual perspective, and then, and then the mentors uh, not only rescuing uh, the individuals who were discriminated in mass discrimination, so we're talking about 200,000 lives, they were discriminated in, in a day, right? Um, uh, and, and that's kind of same level to the pandemic, right? It's just a little bit more time, but we've seen hundreds of thousands of people discriminated in a short period of time, right? Um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think about this, so now we're talking about a, like a, a, a calamity of other source, right? This is like a planet, we, can't, we have not a lot of control over it, right? So the spirits have a question, and uh, Kardec asks that to the spirit, to, and he, he asks question 741, may we avert the calamities that afflict us, right? So in other words, like, do we need to go through this, right? Or we can make something to, you know, to avoid this. The spirits are going to say yes in part, but not as generally supposed, right? Many calamities are the consequences of our own improvidence. Wars, for example, right? That's one good example. Like, we create them, right? They're not designed by nature, right? As you acquire knowledge and experience, you become able to avert them. That is, to prevent them, if you know how to study their causes. Even pandemics are averted all the time, right? Some are completely averted, some are not, right? But technically, there will be a point in time that we'll be able to avert most of them, right? Among the EUs that afflict humankind, however, there are those of a general nature that belong to the designs of the providence and from which all individuals receive in a greater or less proportion to share with our respons uh, as a responsibility. They can do nothing about this except resign themselves to God's will. And this is why the tsunami or the, the volcanoes and things like this, they will go into this category, right? There's not a really a lot we can do. But even these eels are usually aggra aggravated by human carelessness. Well, they are, right? Because if we're destroying the planet, the chances of, of catastrophic events go up, right? So even in that scenario, we have a little bit of a role, okay? Among the destructive calamities that are natural and independent of human actions, you find the 
uh, floods and inclement weather conditions and all those things. Uh, but in science, in works of art, in improvements of agriculture, crop rotation, irrigation, you know, hygienic conditions for pandemics, right? See, they're actually telling us a hundred years ahead of time what was going to happen, right? Um, has not humankind found the means to neutralize or at least mitigate such disasters, right? Aren't certain regions that were formerly devastated by terrible calamities protected nowadays? Therefore, there will humankind not accomplish their, their material well-being when they know how to make use of all the resources of the intelligence. And when, caring for their own self-preservation, they know how to al ally it with the sentiment of charity to the fellow beings, right? There you go. So we can always do something, right? So when so now going back to the to, to the book of planetary transition, this is an interesting part. This is an interesting book because um, they describe, for example, how the spirits uh, are going to go into a mission to rescue all those discriminating spirits at the beaches and the cities um, after the tsunami. And the group is uh, made up of, uh, so we, we, we're thinking about, you know, this is obviously a spiritist book, but the group that is rescuing has, uh, has a, a priest, it has a spiritist, right? Uh, it has a doctor, like a, a, a physician, right? A spirit. Uh, it has a uh, um, uh, uh, Muslim, right? That's rescue at the same time. And, and they're very clear about, you know, they, they, they can hear, they can talk in here and talk in dialects of the region in their own languages and every religion is represented. So it, just to explain to us that this is really um, like, a, like a global effort, like a unifying effort, right? By the spirits to rescue all of them. And the descriptions are sometimes terrifying because Mono explains like down, down to the smell exactly what's happening. Right? And I'll just read like a very small section here and I'll explain it afterwards. So, so the, uh, the, the, the caravan of help approaches the beaches and they say there are several uh, Indian Ocean countries that were littered with corpses, thousands lay under the rubble of buildings destroyed and the tourists fully and ready in uh, plenty new packages for all the paradises and all that. Fortunately, noble women and men organizations and humanitarian entities were sensitized to the pain of their neighbors and came generously offering some resources that could alleviate the despair of the victims. Of the survivors who needed to rebuild their homes and continue their own uh, human experiences, the spiritual spectacle in the affected regions, however, was very serious, actually even worse than the physical one, as he mentions. Likewise, due to the decomposition of human and other animal corpses and the lack of drinking water, the threat of the emergence of epidemics was great. And the spirits, abruptly torn from their organic domicile, wandered, lost, desperate, through the areas that they succumbed, turned into rubbish and debris dumps, in an endless, heavy, menacing night. The cries of despair, the calls for help, and the phenomena magnetizing with other unhappy disembodied people constituted extra physical geography of painful events. So, when they arrived there, so the plan was that they were in a mission to help bring those spirits who were discarnating into hospitals and spiritual cities to be helped and supported. But then, when they realized when they come in, there was like this very complex scenario where we have spirits who are discarnating and they're very evolved spirits and they're already discarnating helping the others around them so it's part of the, the mission right you have spirits who are in very very intense obsessive relationships uh, with many other spirits and incarnated beings and they're all congregating into that very dark, dark energy and you have groups of spirits who are coming attracted to the despair, to that energy, and they make things more complicated, right? And and the many um, cases of obsession that are related, and they are now converging into that scenario, right? So when they walk in, they say, you know, there was, despite the sun outside, that area looked like a storm, like it was gray, and there was like this, almost like they could feel the, the like a storm feeling, right? Uh, because of that dark energy that they were, that we're going through. Um, so they do help hundreds of spirits who are discriminating. 
and then Dr. White, which is the leader of the expedition, uh, you know, um, they, he's asked like, so what's like what's happening here, right? Um, and and then he and then as as the book describes, like he didn't have a lot of time to talk about it because it's actually an ambition, right? But he he says, you know. There are many disturbances that are, were converging into this place, right? You have abused, many of the spirits here had uh, abuse of uh, their sexual energies, um, of drugs, right? There were, many of them were attracted to physical sensations, right? Instead of spiritual ones, right? There were others that were there to help at the same time. So not everyone was there because of that. There are others coming from help. Right, um, and many of them were still very much connected to their bodies and to to matter. Right, so they are having a hard time to discriminate. Right, there are people from all over the world that converged there. Many of them seeking pleasures of flesh. Right, others um, not. But there is a very complicated process. Right, um, and. And, and when, they're, when they were going through, uh, in each case by case, they had a chance to describe kind of the relationship, right, of the spirits and what was happening. And in many instances, and again, looking back at what Kardec told us, yeah, so you can see the good and the wicked being discriminated in the same incident. But it's spiritually, if you read the book, they're completely different, completely different, right? So the ones who are really still suffering and connected to their body because of that shock of discrimination, very, very, very abrupt, right? They're going through a lot of the, the, the storms in their minds and their thoughts about the, the acts of the past. And then their obsessors come in, right, to meet them. And that becomes a very entangled story of suffering uh, that they're helping. Uh, and in many other cases, you see this beautiful light, as they describe, of groups that are there just to help, just for the sake of helping, right? And, and that light that brings to that place is the consequence of the whole thing. So basically, in never humankind, as the, the, the book describes here, there's been such a pouring of good energies that are directed to one specific place ever, right? Um, and we can tell that by what we've done in Canada and other countries, right, of, of the, the outpouring of support and, and good energies and vibrations that we sent to them. And that really is the transformation effect of what happened, right? So, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I urge you to read that book because I think it's, it's, very, it's very important. But also... I want to go to, uh, just to finalize here, so what can we do, right? So I go to Evolution Two Worlds, um, and when we talk about perispiritual body and diseases and all of that, there's a very important aspect that has to be reminded always, that Andre Luis tells us um, that, in that book, that constant goodness generates constant goodness, right? Hear the word constant, right? So flashes of goodness are great, right? But constant goodness during really constant goodness. And that while our movement continues in good, so when we continue to push in towards the good, all the evil that is piled up by us is attenuated gradually. So, the, so it's math, right? The more we work towards the good, the less of that evil background that we carry, that heavy load, right, that we carry disappears, right? upon the impact of the helpful vibrations generated in our favor, right? And that's what's happening in the calamity. If you read the book on the, the description of tsunami, it is, you can see the exact description of this flashing light of, vibration, of good vibrations attenuating the darkness of the moment, right? Without the express necessity of resorting to the help of disease to eliminate the remnants of darkness, we may eventually be incorporated in our mental background. So, support for others right, uh, creates protection to ourselves, which is why the principles of Jesus, of uprooting us from animality, pride, vanity, greed, cruelty, avarice, all those things, right, exhorting us to simplicity and humility, now to, importantly, right, during the pandemic, to fraternity without limits, to unconditional forgiveness, establish the perfect humanology for us, right, strengthening the power of the mind in self-defense, against the destructive degraded elements that surround us. 
So that is the message. So the law of destruction is really is the law of transformation. We as spirits are never destroyed, right? And we are continue this road of evolution. And the more we think, work on constant goodness and helping one another and loving one another, the less of those calamities and destruction we're going to see. Because all the physical changes, the physical element changes that we see are going to turn into this little blip of learning, right? It's another opportunity to learn, right? And then we finally going to understand that the law of destruction is really the process of evolution transpiring in front of us. Okay? Thank you all. We're going to come here now. Okay, we have to do the next one. Do we have questions? Oh, do we have questions? Do we have questions, John? Oh, we have questions? Oh, we have questions, John? Okay, no, okay, okay. So we are good. Well, thank you so much. It's an amazing experience to be here. To thank you so much, Marco, for reminding us how important this pandemic is when we think about what can we do, how we can transform ourselves towards the words of God and the words of Jesus. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, I just have. I'm just gonna close now with a small prayer. So I urge everybody to close their eyes and with this, after this beautiful lecture and this awakening of love, love towards ourselves and towards our brothers and sisters all over the world, we thank God for this opportunity that we are here today, hearing his voice, understanding his words, in his works and we ask for a beautiful week and be conscious of all the words and that Marco brought us today so we can work towards our becoming a better version of ourselves and so be it Thank you, Marco, again. Just a few uh, words. We are opening very slowly the TSS, and we are very, very happy. Uh, for now, we are still opening just for the volunteers of the TSS, but we are here, and we'll be, we are just doing a test mode, and hopefully soon we'll be opening for the general public and you'll be hearing us every every week how this is going and as soon as we can have a control and we are clear and we are safe we'll be giving this message to to all of you and hopefully you can come and join us because it is beautiful the vibration that we we are here today and we can feel it so thank you so much uh, and I hope to see you all next week. Thank you.